So free roaming dogs and cats are a worldwide phenomenon. In America, they estimate that there are 60 million to 100 million free roaming cats, which is pretty amazing. And in Brazil, I don't have a, there's not an estimate for how many are in Brazil, but they say that Brazil has the world's second largest population of dogs at 31 million and of cats at 21 million. So estimates of those that are free roaming is quite large, although no one actually knows how many. In Rio de Janeiro alone, there are 150,000 street dogs and cats. Municipal shelters in Brazil, as I'm sure you all well know, do their best, but there have been a lot of accusations of inhumane treatment of the animals. And basically, there are too many animals for the resources that are in the shelters. Um, private shelters in Brazil have done a lot of very innovative type of work as far as coming up with some very creative ideas of improving the welfare of the animals, and we're going to talk about that later on. The central idea of this talk is that the emphasis of animal welfare and human welfare is related. And this is a quote from one of my heroes, Marion Stamp Dawkins. She is a professor of animal behavior at Oxford University in the United Kingdom. And she has done quite a lot as far as advancing the field of animal welfare and making it into a scientific discipline. So her view, which I thought was relevant to the talk tonight, is that emphasizing the human benefits of good animal welfare does not detract from seeing animal welfare as a good in itself. By adding more reasons for people to, anim to value animal welfare will also benefit the animals. She is one of the founders of the scientific approach to studying animal welfare. The numbers are increasing all over the world, unfortunately. And so street animals can be classified based on their level of independence from humans. The levels of street animals, which you'd find in any town, city, or village, are Number one, owned pets who are out for fun. This is the dog or the cat that escapes from their owner's house or yard and has a good time for the day running around. Then there are owned pets who are free to roam but have a home to come back to. There are formerly owned pets who are habituated to close human contact but are now living as street animals and then village dogs. Now I don't know if this is a common occurrence here in Brazil, but when we were in Indonesia last summer, there was this, they called them Bali dogs, but they were the dogs that lived in the village and everybody sort of knew who they belonged to, but they really just ran around in a pack of dogs. And then there are also collectively owned cats who are similarly legally unowned, but are semi-tame in the sense that they like contact with people. I've met a lot of those since I've been in Brazil the last two weeks because a lot of the street cats are quite friendly, I'm pleased to say. And lastly, there are feral dogs and cats who are the wild animals that live pretty much on the perimeter of human life. And many of the, many of the feral cats are never seen by humans because they really live as wild animals. The feral dogs are the ones that can sometimes be intimidating to humans in the sense that they may growl or they may exhibit aggressive behavior. And then the tricky part, of course, with these free roaming animals is that sometimes the presumed owners, even though everyone knows who the owner is, the presumed owners deny ownership because mainly for financial reasons, I think. All right, so the first question we have to ask, which is the heart of one of the hearts of this talk, is what is a decent life for street animals? And that's where the science of animal welfare comes in. So what is a decent life for street animals? Would it be different for dogs and cats? Would it be different for the five categories of free roaming animals that we just mentioned here? This question of what's a good life for these animals lies at the heart of the study of animal welfare. As animal welfare scientists have attempted to answer the question of what makes a life worth living or what makes a good life. Welfare scientists begin with what's called the five freedoms or the five principles of animal welfare. And that's what I have seen up on the screen there. 
This is from the Farm Animal Welfare Commission, which was a, pro a commission from the United Kingdom back in the 50s and 60s when the public began to notice that farm animals were badly treated. So a bunch of scientists from Cambridge and Oxford got together and studied this. And these are the five freedoms that they feel are relevant, not just for farm animals, but for all animals. So we have to think about those five freedoms in terms of the street animals. Now many scientists feel that the five freedoms raises more questions than it answers. For example, how do you weight the five freedoms? Which is the most important of those in any given situation? For example, the dogs in this photo here clearly have the freedom to express natural behavior. That's one of the five freedoms, or the freedom to express normal behavior, meaning they can live as dogs doing doggy things like running around, sniffing garbage, all this kind of thing. So the dogs in the photo clearly have the freedom to express normal behavior, and they can probably find shelter from temperature extremes, but do they receive adequate nutrition? What about the freedom from pain, injury, or disease? That was one of the free five freedoms as well. An American veterinarian, Dr. Jessup, has stated that free-roaming animals also have the freedom to live short, brutal lives and experience a painful death as they experience little or no medical care throughout their lives. Jessup says, feral cats do not die of old age. They are poisoned, shot, tortured, attacked by other animals, hit by cars, or die of exposure, starvation, or disease. So there have been various veterinarians, and I don't want to insult your intelligence since you're all either vets or soon to be vets, but many vets have studied the free roaming animals. And naturally, there is, these are some of the many medical concerns. For example, kittens have a 50 to 75% mortality rate which means in any given year, 50 to 75% of the kittens who are born don't survive. They also have parasites, viral diseases, traumatic injuries, and rabies. Now, we're gonna discuss rabies in Brazil because that's kind of a complicated factor, but just for now. Worldwide, most free-roaming animals live in developing countries and are found in largest numbers in those areas of each country with the most poverty. So another question that's relevant is how do we assess the welfare of animals when in some cases the humans in a given community do not themselves have the five freedoms? Does the welfare of humans trump the welfare of the animals? How can you ask a community of people who may be financially not well off to care about the welfare of the animals when some of those humans lack basic nutrition protection from temperature extremes, nutrition, or medical care. So how do we move beyond the five freedoms to include the community's interactions with the animals, i.e. the cares of the community who, cares of the community animals who experience themselves hunger or fear regularly? or there may not be any veterinary care in the area. Humans and animals both benefit from contact with each other. The main danger to humans seems to be dog bites, some of which leads to rabies, others become infected. This can set up a chain reaction of people becoming more afraid of the street dogs and the dogs being more and more cut off from human contact. We will now discuss some topics concerning the fear of rabies and some pro pro, um, programs to reduce this problem. In 1973, the Brazilian Ministry of Health began a large-scale program to prevent human rabies. Numbers have decreased since this program, but in Brazil, there were still 163 documented human rabies cases between 2000 and 2009. 45% were transmitted by bats, but dogs and cats were responsible for many of the others. It is still considered a serious public health problem, although the numbers have decreased in many states. Now, as a newcomer to Brazil, this was very puzzling because I, re I read through dozens of studies about rabies in Brazil, and one author concludes there's no problem, another author says in this state there's a big problem, 
So my conclusion that I came to was that because it's such a diverse country, that in some states the problem is mostly eliminated, but not in other states. However, a, British, a Brazilian scientist or veterinarian, Cordero, concluded that do, quote, dogs are still considered the main reservoir of the rabies virus in Brazil. That was a recent study from 2014, I believe. If anybody wants that citation, you can get to me later and I'll give it to you. Studies in other countries show that 66% of the victims were male of dog bites which led to rabies, and 44% were under age 20. Bites were 33% on hands and 39% on legs and feet. As you can see in this photo here, which is from the World Animal Protection, it's oftentimes the young kids in the neighborhood, in the villages or in the town that, want, that associate with the dogs. 19% of rabies, vaccine, rabies bites have been caused by cat bites in general studies from around the world. So it's clear that children are the most at risk group. Another important finding in this was a worldwide study of developing countries, was that only 17% of the animals had been vaccinated against rabies. So many authors and or international organizations suggest that a rabies prevention strategy should involve education for young people and adults, as well as vaccinations, and hopefully reducing the dog population. Many programs focus on educating young people for several reasons. And when I talk about these programs, these are programs that are actually in existence in different parts of the world, usually from international animal welfare organizations. So they're edu working on educating young people for several reasons. Not only are they the most likely to interact with the street animals, they are also the most likely to be bit. So I've sort of composed, come up with a hypothetical three-point plan, or actually five-point plan, that could be implemented in a hypothetical village somewhere. So there will be some components to that, include community education, vaccination program, hopefully with neutering, and adequate guardianship program. The adequate guardianship was initially designed by the International Fund for Animal Welfare, otherwise known as IFAW, I-F-A-W. The education program for children and adults will focus on bite prevention and emergency treatment for bite wounds. We will, these organizations then talk about providing the five welfare needs for street animals through the Responsible Guardianship Program. Now many of these, because literacy levels vary considerably sometimes from area to area, these will be done in a way that does not involve a lot of reading. Much of our education program that would be used in these programs is based on photographs and presentations with minimal words, minimal written words anyway. Many regions such as Sao Paulo State have recently passed laws which dramatically increase the penalties for animal neglect and cruelty. So I think that's another very favorable thing. Oh, this slide looks really dark. It's a bunch of street cats that are eating hand up from a crazy cat lady, who was actually me, I have to say, but anyway. So now we're gonna talk about programs to improve welfare of street animals and humans. One of the myths which exists in many areas is that dogs do not need to be cared for, that they can survive on their own without human carers. Since 1994, Animals Asia has had an innovative program called Professor Paws, in which specially trained dogs visit primary schools originally in China but has since spread around the world to help children overcome their fear of dogs and learn safety around the dogs. In countries like Brazil, where there is a, where there is a long tradition of caring for animals, the children are not as fearful of dogs as they are in China. So the emphasis here could be on how to properly care for the dogs and how to read dog body language. This will show the children that the dogs have feelings and that the dogs feel heat, thirst, hunger, cold, and fatigue and fear in the same way that they do. By the end of the lessons, the children will have learned how to feed water and safely interact with the dogs. 
So the idea is that these dogs go into communities and work with the children in the primary schools and they learn all these things from them. Another goal of these sessions is at the bottom here, the Adequate Guardianship Program, which was originally designed by IFA, as I said earlier. This uses using mentors in the community. These mentors in the community are local people. So this Adequate Guardianship Program then it's, it works with local people who are kind-hearted towards the animals and basically teaches them about the five freedoms and how best to care for them. So this, the third program is an exciting tool for reading dog body language called Be a Tree in which children learn how to be, act safely around dogs. Because I'm running out of time, I'm just going to go through this. The idea is, is teaching children to be safe around dogs. Remembering now that children get bit on their hands, feet, and face because they're leaning over towards the dog. So if a dog is acting aggressively, which the kids are going to learn how to identify an aggressive dog, the, the answer is be a treat. Stand still, be quiet, and avoid eye contact with the animals because eye contact with any animal is oftentimes perceived as a threat. So the children have to practice then like that. And the idea is that they role play with each other and have a good time with it. All right, this is the next idea. This is using fun techniques such as coloring sheets and things like that for kids to reinforce the same message about how to act around your dog. 19% of rabies bites typically from, come from cats. We're going to add, there would be some fun activities could be added in about cats, about reading cat body language and how to act around cats, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think I'm going to skip over this vaccination scheme. This basically has to do that with the international um, animal welfare organizations feel that if you can vaccinate 70% of the street dogs in any given area, that that is considered to be a safe level of support, of support and protection against rabies. But we're not going to go into that due to running out of time. And I want to get to the part about Brazil. It's extremely important because rabies is a huge problem for life and it creates a lot of bad welfare for dogs. The World Animal Protection, which is, this is their slide in their program here, they have uh, many very creative solutions about mass vaccinations. And they have groups, huge groups of um, volunteers, basically. A lot of people I know from the UK do take part in these programs. And they, they send a team into a village or in an area and just do mass vaccinations of the street dogs and cats within vaccinating hundreds of animals in a day. And the World Animal Protection has this program called Collars Not Cruelty. So that what the dogs in, that are vaccinated are then given red collars. This therefore then, the people in the village or in the town know that that's a dog that's safe and isn't going to carry rabies. And they also are vaccinated for other diseases too while they're there. The idea is that since the animals are no longer a threat, people's perception of the animals will be changing and their welfare improves along the way. So now I'm going to talk about some innovative programs that are already happening in Brazil. The first one on the right there, Campo Largo in southern Brazil has implemented since 2012 a community dog program with local dog lovers assume basic responsibility for caring for an unowned street dog. This is in effect the same program that I mentioned earlier called Adequate Guardianship. So they, they call them maintainers, and the maintainers agree to provide food, water, shelter, and basic veterinary care. Now I don't understand the funding of this, but somehow it's in, a, in conjunction with the local government. So somehow the government or some international animal welfare organizations gives funding for this to happen. So the photo on the right shows food and water that was laid out in Rio de Janeiro by some local guardians. We were there just last week. There were several cats in the area who appeared to be well fed and healthy and were quite friendly and receptive to meeting people, even me. It was good fun. Also around Rio, I found some of these very encouraging signs. This was a sign that was in a car park near the botanical gardens urging people 
to be careful for cats that might have been hiding in the shade under the car. Then on the left there is also another um, street sign that was in the same area, again urging motorists just to be careful for street animals. I thought that was great. One of the most exciting trends in Brazil that I've been excited to find out about, and I again apologize if you all already know this stuff, but I thought it was really cool. So they've come up with some really clever ideas as far as increasing public awareness of the fact that not all street dogs are horrible, scary creatures, that a lot are actually quite clever and quite trainable. So this was an example at the Brazilian Open Tennis Tournament used four shelter dogs trained to serve as bat dogs, or ball dogs, sorry. So these dogs were trained to run around the perimeter of the tennis court retrieving the balls. Well, this got a huge amount of publicity, and then, of course, the people that did the training made a big point of saying, well, these are ex-street dogs that are in a shelter, and aren't they wonderful? I just thought that was great. Because that was like, a picture's worth a thousand words, you know? So this also leads then to a change of how people view street dogs in their own community because maybe someone goes out their front door and sees a dog and thinks, wow, I love this. And you guys may already know this, but when I heard about it, I was just, uh, I was actually in tears. I want to get in tears again. So this was so amazing. This, Rio, this um, animal shelter in Rio, which I'm not going to butcher the Portuguese, but that was the name of it, had what I considered the best idea of all. So they went to a local pet shop that was in a very expensive neighborhood and took, filled all the cages with dogs and cats from their shelter. So these kind of posh people came in to buy expensive dogs, you know, Shih Tzus or whatever fancy breed they were looking for, and found all these shelter dogs. But they didn't know they were shelter dogs. And so they said, oh, that one is so cute. Oh, look how handsome that one is. And how much was it? Well, this is all on YouTube if you want to look it up. It was just amazing. And so the owner of the pet shop and the shelter workers then said, oh, that one's free. Or that one is a $10 donation to such and such. And so these, all these animals got rehomed. And I thought that was just brilliant, you know? So especially in an area, I guess, in Brazil here, a lot of people buy pets from pet stores, so I just thought that was just so clever. And if you're interested, look it up, it's on YouTube, and you'll be in tears reading it, believe me. And there's a great interview with the um, person that runs the shelter. So, in conclusion, there are so many great creative projects that are improving the welfare of all, both people and street animals, many of them happening right here in Brazil. So I've described only a few of the ways people are working together for the benefit of the community and for the animals. So thank you very much for your time.